Good morning, everyone. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here this morning. I was uh, reflecting, this is the 50th time I visited Korea since 1986. And if you are listening to the last speaker, in particular, if you appreciate the transformation since 1986, which is truly profound, and mostly very positive, I have an optimistic view for the future, far more optimistic than some of the comments by the different speakers this morning. Um, I was asked to do this only last Thursday, the Wednesday night. That's why it's a special talk, because I couldn't send in the title in time for it to reach the printing stage. I was in Mexico City speaking at a superb meeting on uh, science and the humanities and the impact on the future in terms of smart cities, smart villages, smart everything, and its impact on society in, gen in general. And uh, the, talk that, the title that I was just read out it was the one I sent, to, I think it was on Thursday night, while flying back to Canada. And some of this, of what I'm going to say before I give a little summary of the last speakers this morning, um, is convergent with Rob Robinson's presentation, which I greatly appreciate. And some will have a different accent. So, innovation, science, technology can play a very significant role in shaping the future of a nation. By accelerating economic development, by increasing the quality of life of its citizens, and in other ways. What are the main issues that contribute and that countries need to pursue in establishing a cohesive, multi-pronged approach to attaining uh, the objectives I just mentioned. Nations, whether they're rich or poor or in between, there are no excuses, no, no substitutes. They need to have realistic strategies have a solid prospect for success, which engage the imagination of the public. They need to set innovation priorities, as was mentioned, and do proper and regular monitoring and accounting, which I didn't hear about or much about this morning. Because whatever strategies and priorities you set, without proper implementation and without due diligence in accounting and reporting, it can often become, and I've witnessed it, a hallucination. So the whole structure has to be well put in place. And you have to use reliable, defensible performance indicators to measure the extent of success or failure within the country on different uh, on a different basis. So, what are the best practices, and what is the path to success? First, the country needs to find out its assets and deficiencies. It needs to. Uh, do a report, and uh, Robert Atkinson gave it one example, a very good report, comparing your country to those around the world. Not counting patents, for example. Patents are important to the company, individual, so on. But counting patents has no value unless those patents are retained for at least five years after being issued. Most companies, big companies, divest themselves of 85 to 90 percent of their patents which in, within three years. So counting them has minimal value. When we benchmark, it has to be evidence-based and has to be 
uh, defensive. And in doing so, we have to look at issues like knowledge acquisition, research and development and innovation, people, that means education and talent, and business development, whether it's the business expenditures and research and innovation, direct versus indirect support by government, indirect support was mentioned earlier, venture capital startup, and, and so on. Within, with all of this information in hand, the country is usually, not always, well positioned to develop its strategy for the next four to eight years, with national research priorities as a key component. What should not be done is to first set a strategy and then do your assets and deficiencies, which, again, there are too many examples. It's like putting the cart before the horse. What's very important to recognize is, having done all that, don't just copy others. Um, as advisor to Prime Minister and chair of the Science, Technology, and Innovation Council for almost eight years, until three years on May. In the last 24 months, I went to 32 countries to give a presentation on the council and especially on the work it does benchmarking on a global basis. And I tell the audience, don't copy us. Look at how we do things, perhaps be inspired, by us, perhaps not, but you have to carve out your own destiny, your own blueprint, because your value system is different, and your culture is often very different, and the cultural values matter. Never forget that. Many of the people in this room, if I told them I'm Canadian and there's Americans sitting next to me, they'll tell me we're the same. We're not at all. We have a different value system. Our medical system is the most socialistic system in the world. The United States is different. I'm not saying which is better. I'm saying know the differences and carve out your future with the values that you possess. Now let me uh, talk about strategies. I've been fortunate to be a participant in setting up strategies of, in a number of countries. And again, it could be in a poor country, Mozambique in Southern Africa, Nicaragua in Central America. I'll never forget spending almost two hours with the number two of Nicaragua, Jaime Morales. Easier to deal with than number one, uh, Ortega, um, who I met. Uh, and he was asking me over and over again, why is research and innovation important? How will it make a difference to our nation? And what happens if we don't have a strategy? And it was a highly stimulating conversation at the end of which he said, you convinced me why well, this is a equal value at least to Canada or UK or Korea having a meaningful strategy. A country emerging nation like South Africa, was, which has made great progress, yes it has its challenges, but in innovation, Excellent progress. And of course, industrialized countries such as Canada itself and France, for example. Korea is presently in its third five year plan, 2013 to 2017, the so called basic plan, and is now preparing the next, the next plan. Priorities on a personal basis. 2001, I got a phone call, picked up the phone, and the person at the other end of the line said, I'm John Howard, Prime Minister of Australia, and I said to myself, I'm Bill Gates. I simply didn't believe him, but it was John Howard. 
asking me to serve as the foreigner on the committee he was just putting in place to set national research priorities for Australia. That was a wonderful exercise and experience. It taught me a lot. And it taught the Australians a lot because you need an outside perspective. I caution against, and I witness it even here in Korea, say at one, one particular major government institute, which hires a consulting firm without any internal members to set, to do a review, set priorities. Not being conversant with the value system and cultural issues. That report, which cost over a million dollars, I heard it twice, had minimal value. Consultants add great value, but teams to do these sorts of exercises must be a mixture of people from within the nation and those outside the country. It is also not desirable to have only people from within your own country. That applies to Canada as it does anywhere else. So, uh, in priorities, we did a study, the Science, Technology, Innovation Council, and found that countries that set priorities roughly attribute or allocate, I should say, almost the same amount of financial resources to priorities. Somewhere between 30 and 33 percent. Priorities doesn't mean the majority of funding. It means you're making a major effort with allocation of a reasonable proportion of resources to those priorities. The majority of funding needs to be for the best ideas irrespective of area. It doesn't mean, by the way, that the areas of priority shouldn't be the best ideas, yes. But one always must be open to the future. Then benchmarking. Um, I think there was supposed to be the ambassador from Costa Rica. Costa Rica is a small country in Central America, like Nicaragua, but more successful economically. Very low poverty rate in the relative sense, 7%. According to the UN Happiness Index, number two or three in the world. Costa Rica did a splendid job in determining their assets, deficiencies, etc. three years ago. And that raises another point. In doing this, they brought the key stakeholders together, industry, academia, and government. That is essential. Well, in some countries, I notice they're driven by academia and several other industries. Um, Canada is regarded internationally as the leader in benchmark. I'll never forget the letter I received unsolicited from German minister saying after one of our reports is Canada is the benchmark for measuring the innovation performance of nations in an objective and evidence-based manner. I sent it to my prime minister with one word, enjoy. And he sent back three words, keep doing better. <laughs> we were doing our work. So that is what I wanted to say, and in this morning's session, there were some very interesting presentations from the speakers, and I'm just going to, for two minutes, uh, reiterate a couple of points. One on uh, technical innovation and entrepreneurship. That's important vis-a-vis -vis economic growth, and how, how to get society to better understand the value of that regard. And the need for people with higher skill sets, but never forget vocational training. Then, uh, one of the speakers also noted big cities and the peri-urban areas um, 
as self-sustaining units. At this conference in Mexico City on smart cities and smart and big cities, that exact point was raised. Um, and, and the issue of being more efficient came forward, the claim, I should say, which I think needs more reinforcement. Technology policy requirements, the state is needed everywhere. I'm not so sure about that. I've never been persuaded that the state is needed everywhere. Uh, not in the bedrooms of the nation, as one Prime Minister, Canadian Prime Minister said, nor in other things. But the state adds value in many ways. And in direct support of business, for example, the United States, this, the United States government does a tremendously important role through direct support, although as was mentioned earlier, the indirect support tax credits has not been as large and has as large an impact as anticipated. But I must add that 25 years ago, direct support and indirect support then and today are inverse in the United States. It's four to one direct to indirect now, it was four to one the opposite. So the question to ask yourself is why? And is this the optimum value for today's society, not the society of a generation? Uh, Eco uh, Science Foundation presentation makes some excellent points, empowering and mobilizing youth on the initiative, the app initiative, and so on. And on the last presentation, the jaws of the snake or the crocodile. Uh, this is reminiscent of one of the points I think Robert Atkinson made that, you know, there's no more innovation. Not that he agreed with it, not at all. I heard 20 years ago in my field as a chemist, there are no more important things to discover. Things. All of it, I totally disagree. Humanity, humans are very intelligent, creative people. They come up with totally unimagined approaches and ideas. That's why we have the internet. That's why we have other things. So I, I do, not, do not despair. Look forward with optimism that innovation and a, by the way, a very important point by Robert Atkinson is don't look at a narrow definition of innovation. It has to be cross-cutting to all industry sectors, the creative arts, to environment, to biomedical, and whatever. That approach assures success. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor.